All right. <clears throat> Alrighty, guys. Well, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your Friday evening to spend a little bit of time with us tonight. We always appreciate you and we appreciate um, Pastor Seiko and Sister Sharon for coming on. Um, it is our prayer that, again, as always, that God will be glorified and that we will be edified by what is said tonight. So without any further ado, the topic is church hurt, guys. I'm like, oftentimes we hear church hurt from the perspective, from the pew. Um, tonight, we're going to start off with the perspective of a pastor. I don't think when we hear church hurt a lot that a pastor comes to mind, like how this impacts them, but we know that pastors and their wives and their families are people too. So uh, we want to start out tonight by just having a conversation. I'm going to have some questions, and at the end, I will open up um, the floor for questions as well from you guys. We want to keep it engaging, lively but most of all, glorifying, yeah? So, with that being said, Pastor Seiko and Sister Sharon. How are you? Hey, thanks for having us on. Appreciate yes. the uh, hospitality and uh, glad to be on the show. Let's, let's do it. All right, all right, all right. So, um, I've got a few questions that I've written down and I'm gonna kind of work through them. And so, I thought it would be good to start off with some background type questions, yes? So I want to see if you could share how your church was actually started, when, how long ago. Um, so can we start there? How long ago? Uh, His Word is Way started back in 2009. Actually, prior to uh, our inception, um, I was having this, this, this overwhelming, increasing desire to, to begin a church. Um, I was already uh, a part of a, a local fellowship, uh, and I was meant to toward by a uh, former friend and, uh, and, and pastor uh, during that time, uh, he saw the, uh, the gifts and he saw what uh, blessing I was to, to the body of Christ uh, based on, you know, um, my engagement, uh, the teaching that I, that I did, whether it would be in Bible studies, whether it be, you know, uh, in, in counseling sessions and things like that. Uh, so he had always groomed me and always, you know, tried to put me in, in, in environments and in places where I could utilize uh, uh, my gifts. So uh, I would say like around 2005, um, I was born again back in 2000. Uh, a year later after that, I was in ministry. Um, uh, my first church that I was in, uh, my first pastor uh, he just basically, you know, gravitated to me immediately and started, you know, getting me involved in ministry opportunities and things like that. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that that's always the norm. I think that's that's a special, uh, a special situation and an exception. You know, a person is saved and then a year later they may be in positions of of, of, of leadership and things like that. Uh, I'm I'm very cautious when it comes to those type those kind of things. I think it, it comes with accountability and having a, a, a an in depth hands on um, um, relationship with anybody uh, that desires to be in ministry. But that was my that was my um, experience in my case. So uh, from 2001 to 2016, you're talking about 15 years of uh, pastoral uh, ministry, whether it was in a youth pastor, young adult pastor, elder to, you know, pastor um, um, position and uh, format uh, and responsibility. Um, so, so around 2005, 2006, you know, I started just having this, this desire to, to, uh, to shepherd. Uh, people. Um, I, I kind of like was, you know, pushing away from it. But again, my mental, like, brother, you, you, you got, you got to give God has been, God has been, you know, using you, you know, uh, tremendously uh, to bless people. And so, you know, it, you, you don't really, you, you don't really want to put yourself in those things, you, you know, where you think that you have something. The Bible tells you let another man praise your stranger, not your own lips. So um, it was, the, it was that kind of a uh, 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 thing where, I was basically, you know, groomed. I went to uh, Bible college. Uh, um, you know, once I had got saved back in 2000, uh, I was just a few years, I mean, excuse me, a few credits away from uh, receiving my degree. Uh, but God ended up stopping uh, me from going uh, all the way to, uh, to, to receive my degree because of, of pride. Uh, I, I believe that was what it was after my wife, uh, you know, uh, lovingly shared with me that that may be the reason 
uh, why, you know, he did not allow me to uh, receive my, my degree. Cause I was, listen, I was discipling, mentoring, teaching other people and they were, they were walking the stage and I'm still sitting back not getting my degree. And uh, so it was really frustrating. And so, uh, God used that as a humbling thing because I was taking I was taking twelve hour caseloads, two hour caseloads rather, um, and so I was really really passionate about doing it, and uh, and so the Lord ended up stopping me by hitting my money up, <laughs> and uh, and now because any, anything other than that it wouldn't have stopped me, so He ended up using you know using that to to humble me, um, so from there um, I I was uh, um, I was over young adult ministry in my first church, second church I was. Uh, co-elder amongst four other guys. Um, and then from there, uh, I went to uh, my third church uh, where I was over uh, worship, uh, discipleship, counseling, and also um, Bible studies. Um, uh, people thought that I was one of the elders there because I was always, you know, uh, in the mix and always in the, um, in the forefront. But I never was in the position of, of eldership. But people thought that I was one of the one of the elders there, um, but I wasn't. Um, and so that church, unfortunately, ended up splitting because of a sin uh, issue that was not dealt with with one of the pastors uh, there. Um, and so I, uh, people and families ended up splitting. But let me just say this, because prior to that, again, remember I said back in 2005, 2006, I had already had this desire to, to, you know, I knew God had called me to do something in within a teaching or leading a shepherd capacity. Um, but never did I, you know, imagine that it would be to pastor, you know, uh, pastor the church uh, of my own. Um, so what I started doing was I started, you know, writing out doctrinal statements and what I believe and, and, and writing out my methodology and my philosophy of ministry and, and making sure that what I believe lined up with the scriptures based on my position and, and what I believed about, you know, the church. And uh, that was back in 2005, 2006. I started writing a book uh, that has yet to be published. My wife is always giving me a hard time with that. Uh, it's called The State of the Black Church. How far has she gone? What would it take to bring her back? I wrote that book. Uh, I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, 2006, I believe, 2007. Uh, and so uh, it's already written. I just haven't, we just haven't, having you know gotten it published and, and had the money to, to actually publish it every time i tried to have the book published something came up i mean something came up mm. um and so <laughs> so my wife every time i every time i talk about that book she just gives me that look like like dude you 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 just you you you, you that book needs to go out but anyway um mm -hmm. so my third church uh my third church basically um we ended up we ended up leaving uh, because of a, uh, a sin issue and, a, and caused the church split. So for me, that was kind of like, okay, now what am I going to do? You know, because I was a part of this church. I was, I was, you know, uh, I mean, deeply involved with that church. And so um, it was like, I didn't hear no voice or anything like that, but I was, I was in my office uh, one day and I was like, man, you know, I'm very picky about, going to the church very picky about you know being a part of any type of fellowship uh that's not going to be you know genuine and so right then and there this is back in i want to say september early october um i basically said okay lord this 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 is what you want me to do then i'm, I'm going to i'm going to you know walk by faith and do this and, and also have the confirmation from people that may have seen it as well so i talked to my wife about it i walked in the room uh because i'm an early riser I'm an early riser. So I walked in my room and uh, I said, I said, dear, I said, um, I think it's time for me to start a church. And so she was like, what, 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 what you mean? Like us? You mean you? Mean you? I said, yeah. I said, because I mean, she saw, she saw all the documents. She saw all the writing. She saw all the stuff. And I said, look, I said, but I want, I want to have a church that's going to support us and, and, and at least let us, you know, uh, come up under them as a sister church and accountability and things like that. So we went to our, went to our former church, uh, uh, the second church that we, had, you know, that we were members of. We was in good standing with them at the time and all that. And so we had a, a, an inception service. And, um, and so the elders there uh, laid hands on me. Uh, they they uh, basically sent, sent me out with their blessing. And uh, um, I was already ordained anyway from, from my second church uh, before, you know, um, 
our church began anyway. So our church started in 2009. And, um, you know, we started in our apartment first, third floor, from the third floor. Uh, so, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, uh, one, of the, one of the brothers that, that joined the church, um, he, he met me at one of my former churches. Matter of fact, the last church that we were a part of. And uh, he, 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 was, he was not even a Christian at the time. Um, and so he said, man, this brother preaches like this, man, wherever this dude, you know, uh, is teaching a pastor because he thought I already had a church. And so uh, his cousin said, no, nah, man, he, he, he teaches here. He said, man, that dude ever, ever passes the church. I'm, I'm, I'm going to where he is, man. That dude's teaching is, you know, is great. So make a long story short, when he found out that I was passing the church, he was one of the first people that came and joined our church. His name is Alfonso Neal. Uh, I ended up discipling him, ended up, you know, teaching him. Uh, grooming him, growing him, and uh, he was a co-elder of our church. Matter of fact, his wife and and uh, him and his wife uh, uh, actually met here at our church, and they were both single at the time. And so uh, I, I had the pleasure and the, and the privilege and the opportunity to marry both of them uh, and bless their first child. Uh, and so it, it was just a blessing. So you know, we, we've had a lot of great, great experiences uh, here at um, at uh, His Word His Way. Uh, during that time, you know, we've even had people come from Lakewood. Can you believe that? From Lakewood. And <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. And, uh, but it, it was short lived, of course, because I stopped talking about the doctrines of grace and started dealing with that Calvinism thing. They did, but yeah, where's that exit door at again? Like, yeah, right over there, right, right there where you came in. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I love people. My wife, I mean, she can pretty much, you know, tell you now. My wife is not always a talkative person. I'm, I'm the I'm the talker, but when she when she talks, it, hold, hold on a second, y'all. Let me. I want to put some I want to put some intermission music on so y'all can hear all this stuff going on in the background. <laughs> but no, uh, but yeah. So anyway, so we 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 love God's people. We love the church. Um, in spite of what has gone on. Uh, with us, hey man, we we want to we want to give our story and to help other people to to know um, this is real. This this stuff is real. It happens to pastors. I, I've gotten emails from people uh, when they heard about our church, you know, shutting down and uh, the reason and reasons why we did. They're like, man, keep us in your prayers because man, we're going through the same thing too. And I'm like, man, you know, so. This is why I had reached out to you and said, hey, you know, I would love for us to talk about this. I think this is something that is needed. I think this is something that is important. And also just to give our perspective and to help people also understand that, yeah, church hurt is real, but you can overcome it and you don't have to be bitter. You can be better. Amen. Amen. So um, let me ask you this. So you said you went back to the second church that you were a member of, which is also where you were ordained. And that's mm -hmm. basically who commissioned you. Right. Um, to start your new church. Did right. you have any type of pastoral support from that church, though? Uh, at the time, well, for a year. Yeah. For a year. They, they, year. They, they undergirded us financially for a year. And, uh, and they said, after that, you know, we're going to see if you guys can, can, can exist, self-exist on, on your own from there. And that, and that was fine. Uh, awesome. But yeah, yeah. Awesome. Now, and let's talk about plurality of leadership when you established your church. Now, I know you said Afonso. Am I saying his name correctly? Yep. Okay, um, that you um, mentored him, groomed him once he came a part of the church. So did right. you bring over any elders with you when you established the church? No, at the time we didn't. Um, we, when we started the church, we, we uh, gave our doctrinal beliefs. We told everyone there that our target and our goal uh, is to be elder rule. And so we also looked at how also in, in the book of Acts, how uh, prior to churches becoming elder rule, there were still churches, but then they installed other uh, men, godly men, and uh, had elders there as well, too. So it's the exception. It's not the norm. I know most Baptist churches, and I know most churches that end up in the African-American community, uh, they just have the, you know, the single pastor model, sole pastor model, and that's pretty much it. But we've always, uh, during that time, uh, had uh, embraced an elder rule. And also at the same time as well, you know, was moving toward that and was praying that God would either raise up men within our congregation or either bring people uh, uh, 
to our church. So we saw the model. We saw the model displayed in Acts. We also saw the model displayed in, in Titus, where Paul tells uh, uh, Titus to it to you know install or to you know uh, ordain uh, elders in every city. So that's a process. As we see that being a process, but at the same time, there were still churches that were in existence. Awesome, awesome. Now, this question is for Sister Sharon, um, as it relates to um, when this church was getting founded, because I know we're going to talk a little bit later about things that arose <laughs> um, as it related directly to you as being the pastor's wife. So I want to kind of bring in the introduction of when the church was established. What was your role set out to be? Were well, you going to be doing women's ministry? Were you going to be doing, you know, Bible study? How was that going to work out? Um, well, it's funny that you bring that up because that was, um, that was something that Seiko and I had talked about um, even prior to uh, us having our, his own church. But um, it's, it's one of those things that, that has a misconception on it where it's automatically assumed that the pastor's wife will lead Bible study. She will lead women's ministry. She will be the first lady um, of the church. And I don't like that title per se. Um, in fact, I don't like the title. I don't want anybody to call me that. Just call me Sharon. Um, so that was one of the things that stood out for us and what my role was going to be. My, my primary role is to be his helper, Amen. Um, to be the helper of my husband and to care for my home and to care for my children. So that was my number one priority, my number one ministry. Um, church came third on that list. And it still comes third on that list because I still have small, <laughs> I still have small children. So- um, Are you trying to whip your head back and forth? <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Um, but yes, that's, that's definitely something that we discussed and talked about from, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this. Um, was that something that was communicated to, uh, the congregation, what your role would be? You know, it was, but I will say this, it should have been communicated probably more often because mm -hmm. I think that people... Even, even though even though they were told at the beginning, I think as time went on, they kind of forgot <laughs> what what my primary role was. So it, it became um, looking to me to be the sole teacher, um, looking to me to be the sole responsibility for the women in the church. So I think now looking at on looking back on it in hindsight, it probably should have been repeated more often because we started to talk about that. I think mm -hmm. closer to the end of this church now, uh, what my primary role is because we had noticed that people had forgotten. Mm -hmm. Had to give them a reminder. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So um, how many members of record did you guys have? Let's start there. Notice, notice I said members of record. <laughs> I would say um, on record, it was about 17. Yeah. And that's including the children that came with those families. But adults, but adults, adults I would say probably around. About seven? About, about, no, about, about 10. 10? About, okay. about 10. Because yeah, because we, I think our family was the, had, had more, had the most kids. Yeah. Uh, we had our own, <laughs> yeah, we had our own team. So, you know, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I want to say probably about 10 to 12 adults. Because uh, actually, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, uh, there was a time when we had about 25, uh, but not, not, not active. I'm just saying about 25 people. But so we had to basically that break that busy. down about 10 to 15 at that time um, that were either possibly either members or either had, uh, were on the track of becoming it. So I'll say probably strong active members between 10 to 15. 10 to 15. Awesome. So can you define what you would say, what is a biblical, from a biblical standpoint, what a church member looks like? A church member is, is committed. A church member moves from the, from the crowd, uh, from, the, from the congregation, and becomes one of the committed, one of the core. I would say that where he or she understands what that church believes, understands what they are called to do, 
understand that they have a gift or gifts that is to be used for the betterment, for the blessing and benefit of that local gathering. Uh, a, a committed member is not one that uh, that is not trying to make a name for himself or herself. Uh, they want to make God's name, and not saying they want to make God's name great. His name is already great. But I'm saying that they want to ex exalt and extol God even more in their lives and in the life of their local fellowship. They basically, when I, when that member comes to that church, the whole body is blessed because that person is there. Um, what I'm talking about basically is body life. I'm talking about where each member does his or her part to help the overall health and function of the body overall to grow. When that one member is not there, it affects the entire body. Even though I have 10 fingers, if I lose one of my fingers, I guarantee you I'm going to feel it. Not only am I going to feel it, I'm going to, I'm going to miss it because my <laughs> eyes are going to look at that place or that part that, has, that used to be there that's not there. So a, a committed member understands that they are interdependent. They're not, they're not codependent. They're interdependent. They need each other to, to be a blessing and to, and to grow. Awesome. So with that definition, how many committed members would you say you had out of that 10? <laughs> See how I set that up, Sister Sharon? <laughs> yeah. Committed, um, from my perspective, <sighs> I would say... I'm going to give me a drink right quick. <laughs> Some of this water. Probably three. Three? Yeah, three. Three and a possible? Well, who's the possible? Who's I'm the just possible? making one up, no. that's all. Yeah. <laughs> just to make it interesting. <laughs> just trying to be nice. No. Just trying to be, just trying to be, a, you know, just trying to be nice. Uh, prop, okay, so th three. So she said, okay, said three. She says three. Does that include yourself? No. Does that include yourself? No. Okay. Uh, um, I'm always here. I'm in my house. <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me, hold on. Let, 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 let's hold, hold that. Hold that, that point right there, because I want y'all to understand something. I said to my wife. Somebody asked me. And this was a this was a really a joke, and it was so funny, but true, because we believe in practice church discipline, right? So the question was, what happens if your wife is in sin? What happens if your wife had to be put on church? This is what I told him. I said she had to stay in her room. <laughs> she, she couldn't come out. I mean, where, you got to go there. You're going to be great. Right. Out, time out. <laughs> hey, you can't come out of your room. You have to stay in the room until after service is over. You can't break your bread. You can't do wait, Listen, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do none of that. Okay? So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, that's that's what I mean. so that, that, was a, that was a joke, but I said, if we had that, if we had to do that, then hey, it is what it is. I mean, um, so so back to what we were saying about the about the committed members. Um, I probably will say this evening. I'm, I'm thinking about it in my head. Can't get past three. Yeah, she said committed. Okay, three. Three. Okay, <laughs> we still at three. Okay, okay. Now let's talk about those members a little bit. Okay. Um, in terms of what was the background of those members? Were they um, new believers? Were they transfers from another church? What was the makeup of their backgrounds? Some were. Some some were new believers. Most some were. Most were new believers. Uh, oh, but most. Yeah. Most were new. Some came from uh, other churches. Some had backgrounds. Okay. Some had backgrounds. Tradition. tradition Baptist, you know, just bottom line, um, you know, so yeah, uh, some came with baggage um, and some came with ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, and here's another thing that I prayed for, because when the church started, I said, Lord, give me people uh, that are new in the new faith, faith and those who either desire to grow and to be a blessing to the body of Christ. And I'm going to tell you something, be very, very, you no, know, in the words Lord, of the theologian, in the words of the theologian, Elma Fudd. Be very, very careful <laughs> on what you <laughs> very, very careful on what you pray for because you just might get it. And and so, um, and I don't I don't regret that prayer. I don't regret it at all. Um, because I do believe that even with that, God had a remnant even in the midst of those people, uh, in the midst as well, uh, that 
he can honestly say that these people were, were are, are, are true followers of Christ and, and truly committed to the body of Christ. So, you know, um, that's what we pray for. That's what God gave us. You know, it had, it had its, you know, it had its bumps uh, along with it as anything. Um, but yeah, so that's what we, uh, that's what we had in our church that comprised our membership. Okay, great, great. Thank you for that. So I just kind of want to pay, paint a picture for us, yeah, of sure. what this looks like, what this home fellowship looked like, who comprised that, because I think as you start to give out some of your lessons, mm -hmm. uh, things that you learn from that, the background of that will help. We'll kind of get a picture of that. So awesome. Thank you for that. So let's get to the reason we hear y'all, because I know folks <laughs> are nosy. They want the dirt. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm going to ask, um, when did you get the signs? When did you start getting signs that God was telling you that this was the end? Uh, two years ago. Two years ago. Um, we had, prior to the, um, um, prior to our church shutting down this, this month, um, we we had midweek Bible study, and actually the midweek Bible study was on well, it was online. Okay, due to my due to my work schedule, I was not able to leave and to you know come home and to uh, have everyone to join and be a part of the uh, fellowship physically like we would on Sundays. And actually, again, given our church, um, unfortunately, we were a convenient church, not a committed church. It was based on convenience. It was not based on commitment. Um, and that's and that's to uh, our shame. And I'll take responsibility for that. Um, uh, but so what, what I did was and how the midweek online Bible studies came about was people saying, well, hey, since we know your, your job schedule is, is very hectic and you're not, you know, by the time you get home, it'll be late because I had to drive across town. My job is across town. Mm -hmm. So you talk about an hour and a half drive by the time I get off from, from work. Uh, to get home. So anyway, um, so what we did was, you know, myself and, and Alfonso, uh, we said, you know what, let's do, let's do conference calls. Let's have a Bible study via conference calls. We started doing that. People started listening and coming into that outside of our church as well, too. And they were being blessed by it. They said, well, hey, you know, maybe we can expand this thing, man. Maybe we can try to, you know, have this thing online. So we said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's see how things go first. I was kind of hesitant of it. I said, but if it's going to, if it, I said, but this is what I'm going to do. I said, if we do this, that it has to be 100% member participation and support. Oh yeah, pastor. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This all oh, bless God. We don't, we, you know, all of that. Right. So did that. It was fine for a while and we started doing good. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then we added, we added Thursday night. Thursday night was our real talk Thursday mm -hmm. show. Okay. And that was really, I mean, the, 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 the that had more turn man, than the Bible study. Yeah, did. it did. Of course, because people won't talk. Yeah, yeah. So we, we was dealing with real issues and, and dealing with, we, we, our, our motto was what we did with real issues, but from a biblical perspective, that's what we did. So we had, we talked about any and everything, but we landed with the scripture. So we did that. So I started noticing, look at the list, because I see in the chat and I see, also see on the phone uh, call, who comes in and who listens in. And so since there's only a few of us as members in our church, we pretty much know the numbers on who's calling in and who's not. Now, of course, you can also listen in via internet as well too, but for the most part, we know how most, you know, uh, black folk, they'll, they'll, they'll just, you know, but anyway. Uh, so I started noticing the you know, decline in commitment and participation. And we let it go for a while. So, of course, what we did was we would, you know, let people know. We would put the announcements on the board every Sunday. His word is way real talk Thursday. Please be there. Please let tell a friend. Please do this. Please do that. You know, we was, and maybe some people had amnesia. Maybe some people didn't realize that their church that they've been going to had these things going on. All, only, all, all those only 10 of us in here, give or take 12 on a good Sunday. Uh, you know, so then we said, okay. This event is going on, you know, if you have any questions, see Pastor Woods and, and, and Brother Alfonso, whatever, whatever, you know, just started noticing pattern of just not being committed. And so, uh, so anyway, there you got to raise up, you got to raise up, you got to raise up, you got to see it. There you go. People want to see a short temple now. Come on. <laughs> so, 
So anyway, so um, so so we started noticing people. Bottom line is this was not being committed. So we what we did was make a long story short, we shut down the uh, the Tuesday night Bible study. Shut it down. Now the funny thing about it was you can guess what happened after that. People were like, yeah, they yeah, like, fit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what, what what are we gonna do now? And so what, brother? What, <laughs> Same thing. You you by yourself. I don't know. They said, they said, well, what we gonna do now? What we gonna do now? Where we going now? What we gonna read now? What's happening now? What Bible study we gonna be at now? What time is it now? We said, the same thing you were doing when you weren't here is what you can do since you didn't come. And since you didn't talk, didn't, you didn't listen to me. Do that. They got upset. One, one, one member, one member had wanted to have a meeting with us on, I never forget, it was a Saturday, Saturday afternoon came over and was talking about leaving the church because they don't have anything to do. Mm. There's no, there's no, uh, what was it? There's no discipling. There's no, the, 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 the <laughs> ministries are being taken from us. I said, hold on, hold on, time out, time out, time out. Flag on the field. It's not being taken from you. You're not being faithful to what has been given to you. And what we have told people also in our church was we don't, we don't, create or start ministries right. for the purpose of just having a quote unquote ministry. Mm -hmm. If it's a need and you are qualified and you fit the biblical qualifications for it, then you do it. I'm not that pastor that's going to have all these keys hanging off my pants and I'm opening up doors and doing all this kind of, no, 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 no. Now my Bible tells me in Ephesians 4 that I am to equip the saints for the work of service. I'm not doing all that. So what I did was I say, hey, uh, if y'all want to have a women's ministry, then y'all get together and y'all do that. Men had a men's ministry. We did that. But I'm not, I'm not doing all that stuff. I'm bivocational. So I'm not doing all of that. So we had to remind them and say, wait a minute. Remember when you said so-and-so, 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 and you're like, yeah, pastor, yeah, pastor, yeah, pastor. Okay, so why are you, where's your yeah at now? Mm. So we had to kind of like talk this person down off the ledge and then you're like, okay, yeah, you're right, you're right. Because this person get ready to go to one of the churches down the street, big church. I'm not mad. I'm, I'm not hating on that. But I'm saying, don't try to act as if there's nothing for you here, even though we are a house church, because we were always big on accountability, big on discipleship, big on, you know, being in one another's lives and practicing the one another's. And so we snatched away the Tuesday night Bible study. Then we snatched away the, 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 the Real Talk Thursday one, because they weren't showing up to basically at, to none of it. I mean, I'm serious. It was just like, okay. It, it, like I said, it was a convenience issue. It was always an excuse. Yeah, always you an know, excuse. Work came first. You know, I don't get off in time or I forgot or, you know, that kind of thing. I'm yeah. like, how do you forget? You yeah. at home, all you have to do is dial the phone number. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can be making greens yeah. and call the number and listen and just basically be blessed like that. So now we got people like uh, uh, Brother David, who's in our chat right now. This brother is in Saudi Arabia where it's four or five o'clock in the morning. He's listening to us right now. And he's one of the brothers that I never met before and said, man, your ministry is blessing me. What time your shows start? What time is this? What? And I'm like, wait a minute. If this brother can do this all the way across the water, right? What what is wrong with you when you are right across town and you can't pick up a phone? Something is wrong with that, okay? Um, so what we did was basically was we said, okay, you know what, apparently, we're not faithful in the little, so God can't entrust us with more. So we gotta we gotta stay where we are right here. So this is what we did. We took, we took both of these things down and we said, okay, we're gonna just focus on being a Sunday only church until we can find ourselves to be faithful in what we have been called to do. Now, they was have an attitude about that. Well, how long is that gonna be? As long as it needs to be. Amen. As long as it needs to be. Um, so we started to notice again, like I said, about two years ago, and, and just you know, so it moved from there to, to being petty and, and, and being divisive, and then being unsubmissive, and and I mean, I'm talking, I ain't just talking about the talking about the women. I'm talking about some of the men too. We had men in our church as well. Now it wasn't just women. We had men in our church. You know, uh, had one brother that basically thought that he was a minister, and uh, I'm like, bro, you're not ordained. How, how are you? Why are you? Why are you titling yourself minister this, minister that? You, bro, who? Nobody lay hands on you. What, what, what do you mean? I mean, and, and, and then your life has to line up. Your life and your lips must line up. Your life and doctrine must line up before you can stand before God's people. And so people had issues with this brother. And, and, and we had another brother that came in, and uh, he was seminary trained, but we didn't agree on just the basic stuff. I'm like, Doc, 
I can, we don't we don't believe that here. We don't believe this and this. We believe what the Bible says about this. And so, you know, he he left too. We had people that came to our church sister and said the Lord the Lord led them here. <laughs> Do you hear me? Mm-hmm. Now I take that very soon. Somebody say that the Lord led you here. Either God is bipolar, okay? Either God is bipolar. Or something because the God that I know and read about, He ain't wishy washy. He ain't sometime. He ain't inconsistent. If God is leading you somewhere, then he, he, He's not gonna say, "Okay, well, you know, you can leave now." Come on. Uh, so people say the Lord led them there, and I guess He led them out because our doctrine has not changed since day one. I want to I want to make sure everybody understands that we may have matured in our doctrine, but our doctrine has never, never changed when it comes to the core essentials. We were Trinitarian in 2009. We stayed Trinitarian in 2016. We believed in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ in 2009. We believed in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ in 2016. We believed in the sacraments of God. We believed in it in 2016 going forward. We believed in all of the essentials. So we didn't change anything. The problem was people didn't want to be accountable. And that was one of the issues. And they didn't want to be committed. And they thought that they can come here and just come as they please. There was one Sunday, there was one Sunday, I, I tell you, honestly, God, there was one Sunday morning where people didn't show up on a Sunday. Ask, ask the question why they didn't show up. Why didn't they show up? I'm glad you asked because it was raining. <laughs> because it was raining. Now, I, 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 I've been in rain. I've seen fire and I've seen rain. Uh, but that ain't stop me from going to work unless unless my unless my road was flooded. It wasn't even listen. It wasn't even bad out out, out there. Okay, so people's like, well, I can't make it. Okay, I wonder what they said that on Monday morning when it was time to go to work. Now I, I understand that things happen. Don't get me wrong. I understand that things happen. But I'm a firm believer that whatever you love and whatever you desire, you are going to make time out for that. If people can, if people can beat each other down for an Xbox or for a PlayStation or for a TV or can stand outside at Best Buy a day before the store opens for a sale or days before they camp out before the sale starts, just to get an item that's going to burn up and perish, then what should be our attitude when it comes to the mm. spiritual God? I mean, I'm I'm just one of of of, of priority, and yeah. I'm not saying I do it perfectly, but by God's grace, I'm consistent. And my wife sees it, my children see. It. They know my wife don't wake me up to go to church in the morning. Do you hear me? We've been married almost 16 years. It'll be 16 years come June 3rd. She has not one time woke me up and said. Baby, it's time to get ready for church. Never. Exactly. I believe that the man, the husband, is the priest, prophet, and protector of his home. And so it, I wake my family up. I saw my father do that. My mother didn't wake my dad up to go to church. He had made sure everybody was up. And we prepared ourselves for church. So that's the mindset that I have. So, I, you know, even when we uh, decided to close the doors here, we're going to church Sunday morning. Amen. I told my kids. Listen, I told my kids. Uh, they have the cybership class at nine o'clock. Guess where we're gonna be? Take a wild guess where the Woods family is gonna be at nine a.m. We're gonna be in the house of God with the people of God. So, Amen. Okay, so thank you for that. So two years is when you started. Like, okay, you saw the decline. You yep. saw um, the rebelliousness, for lack of a better term. Um, you saw that things were starting to go south. Yeah. When did the rubber hit the road? Obviously, we know Sunday was the day. Last Sunday was the day that you said, this is it. But mm-hmm. typically, things are decided before you walk. So yeah. when, did that, when did that final decision come? Yeah. And what made it crystal clear to you guys that Sunday, that's it? Um, I was talking with a couple of uh, men that I value and appreciate their counsel and, and, uh, and uh, wisdom from. And so I explained to them the situation. I explained to them what was going on. I mean, everything. I mean, everything. Um, and so, of course, they prayed for me. They, they basically told me, look, look, you're going to have to play the man. And I, said, I said, 
You're going to have to play the man. You're going to have to be the man and stand and make sure that these people understand that they're not going to run this church. That they're not, they're, they're, that this is God's house. This is, this is God's work. This is not a convenient store. And so either they're going to line up or they got to leave. Um, I would probably say last year, I was telling Sharon that. I said, hey, I said, I think it's, 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 it's about time for us to probably, I said, I, it's, it, we, this is going to probably be, be it for us. And she's like, no, I can't. I say no, no, no. 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 She, she's like, no, no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this, this is not it. This, she, we not ready. You know, she's doing all that. I, say, I said, no, this is going to probably be it. This is probably- I was thinking about all the people that, that have listened outside of our church. But I understand that, you know, for the local fellowship, um, and I think even with some knowledge that we had received that Saturday prior yeah. to this past Sunday, we had talked to another member. So yeah. we knew that she was leaving, but it wasn't because of the other stuff. She's actually moving out of state. And her roommate is also a member here. So her and her roommate were going to be moving at the end of this month. So that was another two people gone. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that kind of solidified their decision as well. Um, after finding out that information, but yeah, I wasn't I wasn't hearing it at first because simply thinking about the many people that we get a re we get a report every month from Sermon Audio that tells us all the countries that listen to his word is way ministry, and I was like, what are these people going to do now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah, and I, I can read to you just some of the. Uh some of the, uh, the the countries and places uh, that this little house church here in Sugarland, Texas, um, had 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 uh, was was blessing, and uh, I, I'll pull up in just a second once it once it pops up, and and let, and I'll, hopefully we have time. I can let you just hear some of the places that uh, we were able to reach by God's grace. But not right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good <dog> again. <laughs> yeah, that's your cue. <laughs> and go on. Okay. Cool bees, cool bees, cool bees. So, um, obviously, it's a culmination of of reasons. But again, we want to try and draw out key points. So, if you had to nail it down to like the biggest thing, other than God's sovereignty, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That is the reason that the church closed. Yep. But if we had to pull a life lesson from it, right? what would you say was the biggest reason from a pastoral point of view that the church closed? Uh, <laughs> lack of commitment, uh, unrepentant sin. Ah. Um, and you, can, you can just put, you can just encapsulate all of that. If you had to say pride and pride would branch itself out into different, you know, different issues uh but if i had to pinpoint it i could say there would be immaturity uh lack of commitment a refusal to repent and uh divisiveness um divisiveness so um and i'll say if you want to kill any church let that run its course mm -hmm. I guarantee you you will not have a church anymore after that wow now, let's, she, uh, Sister Sharon, did you want to add anything or co-sign? Um, probably um, one of the things that I think we lack in our churches today, and I have to say particularly our African-American churches, is a lack of respect for leadership. Mm. Um, when you when you don't have that type of respect for the leaders of the church and you have, <clears throat> you particularly have someone who may be a little bit younger, they're kind of looked down upon because of their age, um, regardless of the knowledge that they may have, regardless of the training they may have. Um, and that's, that's, that's to the church's shame. Um, because of that. So I would say that that's probably one of the other things I would add to that list is a lack of respect mm. for the leaders in the church. 
Mm. And it's interesting because we bring up the black church. Mm. Um, you know, you usually see two types of complexes in the black church. And we kind of talked about this. It's either the pastor's baby Jesus yep. mm, or they have no respect for him at all. Right. It is very um, rarely middle of the road. And both of those positions are disrespectful and unbiblical. Right. So right. it's going to lead you down. A, a, if, I, if I worship you, <laughs> if I idolize you, it's going to take me down a place where I'm going to be disappointed because at the end of the day, you are people. Right. Not meant to be elevated to the status of God. Right. So, right. Um, did you feel like any of that was going on at the church at all? Or was it just completely the other way? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Totally, totally other way. Yeah. yeah, totally other way. We weren't, we weren't being, uh, you know, nobody was carrying my Bible. Nobody was tying my <laughs> shoes. Nobody the was all the bears, the devil. Nah, nobody, nobody was armor bearing me. Nobody was, nobody was doing none of that stuff. They listen, I, and I, and I didn't want them to. I brought my own Bible. I got my own sweat. I, you know, I took care of my own. My stuff. own sweat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it was just the opposite. It's like, okay, well, shoot, you know. And then I don't, I don't even think it was intentional. And I want to say this because I had mentioned it on the Periscope. You know, this is not an attack. I'm not attacking anybody. You know, in our church, I'm just describing what went on in our church. Uh, not everybody uh, uh, was there to tear it down, but I cannot say that not everybody was there to build it up either. Um, so we had those issues, and, and, and the smaller a church is, the more prevalent and the more visual uh, or visible problems are going to present itself. So, you know, and if you don't resolve it or when people don't want to resolve and it's, and, and everyone else sees it, then that causes a distraction from the worship of God to the focus on man. And, and that's <laughs> idolatry because God says he does not want any other idols before him. So when you take away from the glory of God, when you and I take away from God's glory being deflected to you or to me, that's a problem. And so, uh, it, it were times, and, and I put it this way, it was uh, times in our church, man, the worship was just like <sighs> dead. I mean, it, it was just, when you have sin, see, people don't understand how dangerous sin is. Sin causes disruption and it causes interruption in the worship of God and amongst God's people. And if you are despondent and if you are distant and if you are aloof, or when you're here, you just drain and suck the spiritual life and juices from the rest of the church, then it causes everything to be affected. And so um, from our time of corporate prayer, you know, to our time of public worship, um, to the practical application of what they of what they heard on Sunday. It's like, okay, are y'all listening to what's being said? You've been at this church for this this many years and you still haven't gotten to where you need to be over here. It's kind of like the writer of Hebrews and Hebrews 5. By this time, you ought to be teachers. By this time. So there's an expectation, a godly expectation, uh, that was not realized among a lot of people. Although they came here, you sometimes wonder, why did you come? Ah. Because we, did, we didn't change what we believe. Mm. Okay, so let's flip the coin a little bit. If we were to ask, and obviously this is just maybe conjecture, but I know you guys have spoken to some of the members um, since you've closed. So yes. this question becomes, um, why would, what would a member say about why the church failed? It would be my fault. And what would they say specifically you did not do? Uh, didn't show grace, domineering. Uh, we didn't do anything. Um, um, people, people always leaving. And basically, if they're leaving, it has to be on the leadership uh, side of why they're leaving. Um, that would be the that would be the overall uh, issue uh, that they would probably, you know, probably conclude. Those who left and left for unbiblical reasons. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, with some of that feedback, as you received that feedback, did you process that and see if there was any truth in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I processed it all. And even, you know, those who knew me and still know me now, I presented some of those things. Matter of fact, all of those things. I'm saying, man, do, do you see this? Or sister, do you see this? No. I mean, I got people that don't even know me that they see what I do and hear my, and hear my preaching and, and just from the outside in, of course, they're like, man, okay, 
this brother's this brother's preaching and teaching and then people that i've never met before that i have met personally just recently like man this brother is is is, is legit this brother is, is is real i wish i could come to this brother's church you know um so i give you a case in point we had a sister that moved from chicago okay moved from chicago said that she had been following our ministry online through blog talk radio for at least a year I think a year, at least a year. She said the Lord let her here. Oh, wow. So she moved. Everything that she had, he got a job here in Texas, moved here in Texas. My wife and I and uh, a couple of the members of our church helped her to move into her apartment. Okay. She became a member a couple months down the road. And uh, we loved her like our own child because she did not have any family here from what we were told okay she knew we taught about accountability she knew we taught about when they come to church and worship and all of it she she understood knew it all all of it she met a guy online uh oh yeah uh -oh. met a guy <laughs> online now i listen i said i treated her like my daughter okay so if i'm treating you like my daughter that means I'm going to protect you. I'm going to have a sense of protection like I would my own kids, right? So even though she was grown and an adult, you don't, you, don't, you don't have the spiritual maturity to understand. First of all, you mean some new dude, some guy you don't even know that you never met from our knowledge, you never met before. And now you want to go see him alone? Have you not seen forensic files? <laughs> have you not seen court case? Have you not seen CSI? Have you not seen, I mean, come on. Have you not seen these shows? She don't have an ID channel. Have, have, you, have you not seen any of this stuff? Have you, have you not seen Criminal Minds? I mean, have you not seen this stuff? Uh, so my wife and I talked to the system. We said, listen, bottom line, um, we're not comfortable with it. You know, we had some other conversations with them. We said, bottom line, we're not comfortable with it. It's not, it's not in order. It's, it's, it's not... It's not wise for you to do that. And I told her, I said, you don't need to be going. I said, matter of fact, you don't, you don't need to go at all. Do not go. That, 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 that day, he came and- uh, yeah, CSI right, right. files and somebody's background. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's Loretta's mic is on. Okay, because I'm lost. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, tell her the popo about to come get her. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, the popo. <laughs> Let me mute Loretta because we don't want to. This is the first 48 on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And Natalia's is unmuted as well, too. Mute them all. Mute them all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is that noise? Oh, shit. Yeah, let's Loretta said, hey, me. Sure, Loretta. We know. We know. <laughs> it's never, it's never y'all. It's never y'all. <laughs> but no, um, so the next day, she basically said, I would draw my membership. Oh, wow. Did she not say that? I would drop my membership from the church. Um, um, basically, don't call me anymore. Um, you know, just, I mean, just, just flipped over a dude that she never met from what we understand. Now, mind you, this, this young lady is in her early 20s. Already had issues. And had not had a good track record with men to begin with. Um, slept on my couch for most nights of the week. She rarely went home. Oh, wow. So she was always here. So she have seen, she had seen how we interact with our children, um, how we teach our children, and what we expect of our children. Now we right. know she was not a child, right? So therefore, we would give her the guidelines and say, "Okay, well, the de the decision is up to you." However, I don't think this is a wise decision for you. Well, that became you know the same thing that we've heard before, you know. Well, I think you're, you're you're crossing the line. I think you're you're trying to tell me what to do, kind of thing. Yeah, I am telling you what to do. <laughs> yep. yep, it's called authority. Yeah, but see, the, but see, so so to answer your question, Sydney, people love you as long as you let them do what they want to do. I'm right. talking about the immature. I'm talking about the naive. I'm talking about those who are not growing in maturity and Christ likeness, although they claim that they want to. When you starting to put them uh, 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 or to have them be accountable for their actions, right. then they, they're looking at the front door. 
they're, they're ready to they're ready to bail out. And uh, and that has been, to be honest with you, I'm not lying to you. You can ask my wife. You can ask uh, you can ask uh, Alfonso. You can ask his wife Joy. You can ask uh, a few other people that that work that are people that are committed to this church have been committed. They'll tell you. People have come in. Oh man, I, I'm I, man, I'm just blessed by the ministry. I heard you on blog talk. Or I, heard, I saw your videos on YouTube, brother. How can I come and be a part? And we tell them the same thing. Same thing. Now, one thing I have not done by God's grace, I don't uh, I don't treat people who may come in. Uh, differently because somewhat because of what somebody else did, you know. Bottom because I think everybody that comes in here, we can't. Well, we've been hurt by this person, so this person gonna probably hurt us too. No, because I don't want nobody to do that to me. Everybody that I basically, um, you know, either pastored or or counsel or disciple or or even had conversations with, I, I, I've been consistent with them. And I'll tell you this: anything that I have done that was either sinful. Or that I needed to repent of, I have done that, but it was it has never been, ever, ever, ever been um, something that I had to stand before the church uh, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to make it right. N- it never been that, never been that. And let me add to that, Sydney. Um, you you asked the question about what would those people say? You know, the people that have left or whatever. And those people have, well, two of those people in particular have, you know, when they wrote letters or whatever, their withdrawal. Mm-hmm. And made these statements about Seiko. They would, you know, whatever he's domineering or whatever. And Seiko would ask them, okay, well, can you give me an instance where I've done that? Can you give me an example of where I've been this way? Crickets, nothing. So basically, most of the time, 95% of the time, we're dealing with emotional women. <laughs> Or Trez Van Man. Yeah, that too. Um, so it was it was always based on their emotions and anytime these particular people got corrected on anything, oh it's it's now pastor in 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 a sarcastic manner, or they would change it to oh okay, Seiko, you know. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I have to sit there and listen to that. Well, and that's a good lead into my next question, which was going to be for you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, because part of this was to talk about church hurt. And um, I don't think that people recognize that as a pastor, but even as a pastor's wife, how emotionally taxing. Mm. It is um, for you to see your husband disrespected, Mm -hmm. um, to be the one who has read all of the doctrinal statements, who have read all of the uh, Bible studies, who have been a part of the prayer, and to see that those people who you still have to labor for, (laughs) because it's still a requirement. Yes. Them being disrespectful, Mm -hmm. them being hurtful. What did that do to you? Emotionally, mm. Mm. keep it real. Um, keep it real. I'm trying to think how far back I need to go with that <laughs> because <laughs> because that that <laughs> that emotional tie goes goes back to probably somewhere around 2010 mm. um, when some particular, as my husband would call them, transvent men. Um, felt some type of way about my husband's leadership um, and would make statements and we would see these people elsewhere, other places. <laughs> and it affected my health. I allowed it to affect my health. Um, and that was something that the Lord had to show me personally because I was having uh, heart palpitations and all this kind of stuff. And I had to go have a stress test done and all of that and scans done, ultrasounds done on my heart and everything. So when the lab work came back and the, the doctors, the cardiologist said, you know, your, your physical heart is fine. I had to do a self-reflection and think, okay, well, my physical heart is fine, but my spiritual heart was not. I was not in a good place for quite some time. So it took me a very long time to 
get to a place to where I didn't struggle with taking things personal. And I'm still doing that mm. in and out. Um, I have some good sisters in the Lord who pray with me, who counsel with me, who uh, give me some godly wisdom. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for them um, giving me the insight that I need to kind of help me stay on track because it, it's definitely hard. But that was one of the, the ways that it was um, carried out was by physical um, manifestations. Yeah. And so I'm just glad and grateful to God that he even allowed me to see that about myself. Yeah. Um, I asked that question to you, Sister Sharon, as opposed to uh, Pastor Seiko, because even though I am going to ask you the same question and we're going to hear a completely different answer, I think, though, because men typically are able to compartmentalize this uh, mm -hmm. a little bit differently. Yes. Um, and especially men like Seiko. Yes. Who, uh, <laughs> you know, could just say, I'm not about this life today. I'm not interested. But so I will ask you. How did it make you feel? Because I don't want to diminish your feelings, Pastor Seiko. But I also want to add to that is how did you feel to see your wife and even your children? Because I'm we're not talking about the babies, but there's impact on your children. When you are in ministry, it's your family that is in ministry. So um, yeah, I, I didn't take I didn't take it personal um, because I knew that it was a spiritual issue more than it would be for me, you know, um, to affect me physiologically. It doesn't mean that I didn't have feelings. I did, but I understand. Uh, where it came from. And, and for me also, um, <clears throat> I consider the source for the most part, when people, when people come at me, I, I just consider the source, you know, either you're a factor or you're a non-factor. If you're a factor, that means you're in my circle. That means, you, you know, you, you in, you're in that circle that I've allowed you to touch me. If you're a non-factor, it doesn't really matter to me, especially when it comes to social media. But when it comes to church, when it comes to church folk, um, even, even, even in the church, you got to, put them in different categories. I mean, Jesus had 12 disciples and only three of them was in his inner core. Okay. Only three of them, Peter, James, and John were the only ones that he allowed to allow them to, to see him disrobe himself and to see the Shekinah glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Mount of Olives. So everybody else didn't see that. It was Peter, James, and John that he, uh, uh, you know, expressed his heart and, and always saying that my soul is grieved, you know, my soul is grieved to the point of death. So, he, he wasn't he, he wasn't uh, making himself um, available or expressing his heart to everybody that you know that he contacted and interacted. So, um, so I, I've learned by God's grace not to not to take those things you know personal. Um, it didn't it didn't happen overnight. It happened through accountability and discipleship. Um, but at the same time as well. When something affects my wife, it affects me because we're one flesh. So that's just a no-brainer. I mean, and then we'll bend back on that. Um, but I have to minister now to my wife. You see what I'm saying? Because forget what everybody else. If my wife is affected by something, then church takes a back seat because the church came after marriage. It didn't come before. And I think that's what a lot of pastors mess up, is that they put the church before their marriage. My marriage, by God's grace, would never, ever take a back seat uh, to the church. Not, not this woman. Okay. So, so I noticed that and I told her, I said, listen, I had, I had to lovingly share with her. I had to walk her through some scriptures. I had to walk her through Psalm 32. I had to walk her through Psalm 38. I had to show her, you know, when you kept silent about your sin, your body wasted away as, as, as the fever heat of summer. Your bones were aching because you had to confess that sin. You, gotta, you, you made that thing internal instead of making it vertical. You see what I'm saying? Instead of taking that thing to God, you took it upon yourself. And now it's causing, you know, uh, physiological, psychological, you know, turmoil. And so once she saw that by God's grace and like she admitted, you know, she has to battle with that. Um, uh, once she saw that, okay, these are the triggers. And I, and then also me telling her, Hey, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not tripping about that. I don't want you tripping about it. Cause I think that's also comforting to our wives when I, when the husbands tell their wives, baby, honey, sweetie, dear, listen, I'm not tripping about that. So th if I'm not tripping about it, I don't want you tripping about it. If I start tripping about it, then we both can trip about it. But until then, <laughs> I don't need you tripping about that. Both of us don't need to be tripping about somebody that's that's not gonna put us in heaven or hell. You see what I'm saying? So it's about perspective, it's about priority, it's about you know, um, who does this person represent? Because not everybody that professes to be a Christian is really a Christian. Say that. 
Okay? Some people are on Satan's payroll. They just don't know that. And some people are being pawns for Satan. Um, and I'm not saying people here in our church are not, we're not saying, I'm just saying that there was, mat- there was maturity issues or the lack thereof. There were things that could have been dealt with and handled if they were to have submitted themselves to the word. And, and we had one sister that, that came in and admitted, you know what, I have to take responsibility for our church shutting down because she says I was obedient, but I wasn't submissive. Mm-hmm. Now, she said that, and we knew that. Mm-hmm. We told her that. Other people saw it. Other people told her that. So it took. And I would say, and I would say, you weren't obedient. You were compliant. Okay, then. Come on. Come on. Because submission is tied into obedience. So my response would have been, you were compliant. Yeah. I I agree 100%. No argument there. And so now I I tell people, when you are responsible for the destruction or demise of God's church will be unto you. Mm-hmm. See, I rather I rather you I rather you be arrested for arson than to destroy God's church. I mean that that's that's just me. I, I just it, I, I can honestly say, Sydney, I can honestly say, sister, that his word is way did not shut down because of Seiko and Sharon Woods. His word is way to not shut down because of Pastor Woods. His word is way to not shut down because of Pastor Alphonse Will. No, his word is way shut down. Like you said, first of all, God's sovereignty, but also since we know man is responsible because of people who came in and did not want to line up with the word of God. And since we were a smaller church, and see this is one of the dangers is also, because the smaller the church is, the greater the effect and the fallout when situations go awry. If we were a big church, two, three hundred people, give or take one like that, even if we were over a hundred, I mean, four or five people leaving, we would have still kept it going. But when you're comprised of, 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 of seven to ten people and half of them people left and it's only my wife and I and, and, my, and my co-elder and maybe another brother, I said, no, we, it's, no, we, we can't continue to do this. And, and so I, I told people I would rather close the doors than to give God slop. I'd rather close the doors than to give God half of what he deserves. If he deserve, if he doesn't get all, then he definitely deserves half of it. It's Amen. either all or nothing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, so with that being said, what do you guys wish you would have done differently? Uh, you know what, going forward, I said to myself, um, I would never, I would never pass a house church. Why? That's just me. Um, because of the, because of the, the effects, because of what it entails. I think a lot of people, the stigma, the stigma thank you. The stigma, the stigma of a house church for the most part, especially amongst black people is that it's not a church. We were called, we were called a cult. Uh, we were called, uh, not a church. We were just basically called a gathering of people. Um, uh, and we had it all laid out biblically. We had leadership. Had the teaching in the word, we, we had all of that. Um, so when it comes when it comes to the African American or the Black, you know, culture, uh, if it's not a building, if it's not you know uh, a pulpit and a stage or whatever the case might be, Black folk don't see it as being a church. They 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 see it as just you know a Bible study at, at most. At most, it may be a Bible study if it's, if it's not a church. Um, so for me. I said I would probably, if the Lord were to resurrect uh, his word his way, um, that I pray that he would allow us to be in a, in a building, whether it be a storefront, you know, or, or a rental space at another established church that we can, you know, rent and use until we are able to, you know, function or whatever like that. But I, I said for myself, it would never be again in a house church. Uh, that would be one thing. Um, you, I would you, probably, can I ask a question, Pastor Sako, sure. about that yeah. point? Um, Do you think that's something that's inherent to our culture, though? Because there's been many of our white brothers and sisters who started homes and the members rallied together to purchase a building. Um, Do you think that's something in us? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's definitely that. It's it's definitely... It's definitely a cultural thing um, because people, again, don't consider consider black people that gather in a home to be considered as a as a uh, as a church. And, and this it's, it's is a stigma. I mean, even people who some of the people who are members of our church, you know, uh, one one member whose family traditional Baptist, she thought or her family thought that she was belonging to a cult. 
They can. Well, when you throw reform theology on top of that, they oh man, that's a code anyway. <laughs> oh man, who are you talking about? Like, come on, who are you telling? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, you you have that stigma, absolutely. <laughs> And I would like to add to that, along with that stigma, um, the the thing that ties into that, particularly with home fellowships and our, our African-American brothers and sisters, is how the church uses funds for the church that's yep. in a home. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, Speak on it. There's a huge misconception on how a church should be ran if it's in your home um, versus it being in a building. Um, I think we already know that pastors are supposed to be paid for (laughs) what they do. Um, However, my husband never received a salary, not from this church um, and didn't ask for one. Amen. Um, Because this, this was something that God led him to do. So, there, that wasn't even an issue. Um, but when it gets to the place where people are, I mean, you're using plates, cups, tissue, wipes, you know, my carpet needs cleaning, you know, my lights, water, everything. Mm-hmm. So when funds are being dispersed and used for those things to help maintain those things, our people in particular, unfortunately, have a misconception of, well, that's your house. Wow. Rather than it being, it's God's house. That we use the church that meets in his house, in, your, in their house, for some of the quote. And that's very unfortunate, but it's a, it's a big thing, particularly with our people. And that's sad. Very that's really sad. You don't see that amongst our white brothers and sisters. Nope. And I've talked to I've talked to several and many of them uh, who have house churches, and they're like, "Yeah, we don't we don't we don't have an issue with that." I mean, why why would people have a problem? You know, uh, and and, then, and me also say this: I don't know who gives what. I have no knowledge of any of the money, finances, and management of any of that. That's between uh, uh, Elder Neil and my wife at that time. Uh, and when we first started, it was agreed and voted that since my wife had a degree in finances and, and accounting, that she would be uh, over that. But at the same time, we would we would oversee that as well. I did not have any knowledge of that, but we made sure that we had business meetings every single year, uh, with the exception of the last two years here recently, because our computer crashed and we lost everything. And we were accused of, of, of stealing monies uh, because the computer crashed. I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute. All these years we've been with you and we're being accused. Listen, if I were to take you downstairs and show you on my on my on my camera, I have the same <laughs> I have the same furniture that I had before I met my wife. We've been married almost 16 years. I've had that furniture for 18 years. We just we just bought our bedroom set and I had that bedroom set before I married her and I was a bachelor. Okay? I see, see. <laughs> Let's see the subject. See that? Let's just say the subject. See, I, I'm just trying to bring a point. We're going all the way back there. Well, we're gonna need counseling after this. We need counseling. <laughs> but it, it's, it's really sad how our people look at finances when it comes to giving, when it comes to supporting the pastor, regardless of what scripture says. They don't. They don't. You can tell them that, and, and did tell them that. Just about every Sunday, it was mentioned what funds were used for. But it was like it went in one year and went out the came in one year and went out the other. I, can I read? Can I read a passage of scripture? I want people to understand that this because because again, we want to help other churches not go through what we went through. Okay, if you are a pastor, whether you're in a house church or whether you're in a in a, in a, in a building, okay, because it, it's really not about the building; it's about the people. But the church meets somewhere. Somebody is going to have to pay to keep lights on, okay? So whether your church meets in your house or whether your church meets in a building, somebody is going to have to pay for these expenses, okay? Nothing is free. Somebody has to pay for it. Now, this is in 1 Corinthians 9. 
Um, I'm just going to skip down to verse 3. We all know that this is Paul. He's defending his apostleship because the last people he should have, he should have to defend himself to is the, his own people that he spiritually birthed into uh, the ministry as a church. Um, verse 3, Paul says, My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have a, have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? And who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I'm speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? He says, I, or oh, excuse me, does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher the threshing hope of sharing the crops. If we sow spiritual things in you, is it too much? Every time I read Paul's words, he says that. He says that, is it too much if we should reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things that we may cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know? that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share at the altar. So also the Lord directed. I want, I want every preacher and every teacher and every Christian who goes to a church and who has a pastor who is faithfully, a, let, me, let me qualify that, a male pastor. <laughs> I'm qualify that thing. Uh, who preaches and teaches God's word. Uh, the Bible says, so also the Lord directed, 1 Corinthians 9, 14, those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Say go. I want to pass the scripture as well, too. This is in 2 Corinthians, because I want you to read what Paul says here again to these same people. These same people. Let me go down to verse, uh, well, I said verse 3 again. But I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceive Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity and devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another God, another Jesus, rather, whom you have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way, we have made this evident to you in all things. This is where I'm hanging it on, verse 7 and 8. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? I, I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you, verse 9, and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need, and in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. As to the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine would not be stopped in the re regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. Now, I'm reading that because that's my heart. That is my heart. My heart has never been to take money from, listen, I am by vocation. I'm a bivocational pastor, okay? I work for everything by God's grace that I have. And at the same time, if anyone gives, they give. But you can look around my house, and it, it, let's just keep it real. You can look in the closet. Let's, let's, just, let's just keep it real. Sister Sydney, if I was trying to take advantage of God's people, why are we three months behind on our rent? Okay? Now, this ain't no pity part. I'm just being, I'm just keeping straight at 100 with everybody. Yes. If, if, if that's the case, we wouldn't be three months behind on our, on, our, on our rent. And praise God, we have a landlord that's a Christian. Right. Praise okay? God. Now, let me, let me go this further with you also as well. Uh, every year, we turn over our income tax return to our landlord for any monies that we have yet to pay for the rent that we were past due on. Okay. If we were to try to do that at a regular, uh, in a regular, uh, you know, apartment or at, you know, at just, just at a house, yeah. we'd be, we'd be yeah. gone. So don't think that this stuff was not communicated to our church. It was. So to be accused 
of stealing money or be accused that we are misappropriate. trying to misappropriate funds because a computer crashed this and my my Bible software program was on that computer. Uh oh, not your logos. Come on now. That's thousand dollar software. We don't let that crash. We can't go without no, that. Listen, say the logos now. Say that. But Take you know what I'm saying? So we listen, we 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 were we were explaining all of that. And so, praise God, we were able to try to, you know, so we had to take the computer and get it, you know, um, cleaned up and everything, but we lost it. So I, I'm able to put the logos back on it. But my point was, is that to, to tell, to, to communicate that and for the person to say that who knew us, who we thought knew us, Jeez. that was there. That was more hurtful to my wife. It, it, it upset me because it upset my wife, hurt my wife. Thank so one, one thing, we're not our thieves. That's one thing we're not. Pastor Seiko, we have a question from Harvey or Harvey, brother. brother actually, brother. actually, it's it's uh, Harley. Harvey is a uh, oh, brother, brother Harvey. It, How you doing, it's, sir? It's kind of a just a pet name that uh, <laughs> <laughs> long story. But uh, look, I I've been listening right from the beginning. I'm kind of running into or running from here to do some editing and things. Yes, sir. Uh, for the school. And, you know, you hit a, a, a very interesting subject about that, uh, the, the house church I've been teaching out over the last month or so from our study in Acts. And it's not necessarily that it's a cultural thing per se, because the, the bulk of the congregations that I've had in the house churches have been white. Yeah. And uh, even recently, as recent as a few weeks ago, um, we were kind of put out of the house of their home, even though officially our fellowship meets in our own home in Santa Ana. Mm -hmm. And I told the brother, I said, you know, we're fine because the church who was here for long before we came here, we came to your house out of convenience for you to drive. And like you, you know, I used to support his work and give him finances for, you know, his ministry. And I never collected anything financially from him. And I spent our gas money to take my family down there for his convenience. And uh, his wife went a little cuckoo in the head. And she decided that, you know, she wanted to do her thing. And I said to him, brother, you know, you're in control of your home. Right. And if you're not going to take control of your house, um, I'm not going to follow your wife. Amen. Now. If she doesn't want to be here or us to be here, that's fine. You know, we were in Santa Ana before we came here. And if you like to, to continue to come, you know, you're more than welcome to come, you know, the Santa Ana Fellowship. Well, he hasn't come back since or contacted us. But these are things that happen because, as you pointed out, it's the condition of the hearts of the people. We're in an age where I don't care where it is. I've had larger congregations. I've had medium-sized congregations. I've had smaller-sized congregations. And it's all symptomatic of the same problem. And I've been saying it for decades, nobody wants the truth. We don't want it. We're not looking for it because if we did, um, we would find it. We'd search out for it. Very few people really want the truth. And, you know, everybody says they want the truth until you give it to them. <laughs> so we encourage, you know, both of you, you're on the right, right track. Just seek out where the Lord wants you to be and stay there and function there and just learn this, uh, you know, continue to learn this as a lesson that people are going to be people where you go, you're going to find the same problems. You know, right. they're everywhere, brother, sister, they're everywhere. They ain't going nowhere. Amen. But uh, we have to be firm by holding on to the Lord and holding on to his truth uh, until Christ comes and gets us home. Amen. I appreciate Amen. you, Dr. Harvey. I mean, Dr. Harvey. He keeps <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate you so much. Yeah, be 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 faithful, be and, and be steadfast. You know, your your labor's not in vain. And if you've done everything, and I, I felt real sad to hear your own condition. And trust me, I know exactly where you're coming from. I have to work as well. And uh obviously I'm putting out tons of things, tons of materials and have been doing so for close to 40 years. Yes. And I, I get where you're at, and I know it's a heartbreak, but it's a condition of the people's hearts. They just don't want to hear the truth. They're trying to take us out. They're going to do everything they can to do it, and we just have to be faithful. Amen. 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 Thank you, Amen. sir. Thank you. All right. God bless you. I'm going to get back to the editing and what have you, but uh, 
Stay encouraged, and you know the address. You need to talk. You know the phone number. You know the contact. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, guys. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let me take myself back off of mute. That gave me a chance to eat some grapes and drink some soda. You know, fat girl problems. <laughs> fat girl problems. Hashtag it. Rico don't know about that life no more. You see how he's slimming down over there? <laughs> We need to be on a Rico workout plan. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, I think I have asked all of the questions that um, I had written down, and uh, so I wanted to open it up to others. We are at the hour and a half point, so just kind of want to be mindful of that. I'm going to take ask that you guys can unmute yourselves if you have a question for Pastor Seiko or Sister Sharon. And also, could they, could they, if there's any background noise, they can minimize it as much as possible since we're going to be recording this. And it's uh, Sister April, that's for you and your 5,000 children. That's what he was. <laughs> wow. My kids supposed to be in the bed. I had two of them, but I think they're in the bed. So we're good. <laughs> yeah, your, 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 tribe of, your tribe of Israel. She came in, her baby came in like. <laughs> Y'all still on here? Oh my goodness. That was Haley. She moody like that. She He's talked so about she needed me to do her bedtime story. It's so cute. Yeah. So did anybody have no, questions? I, I wanted to say I, 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 honestly oh. my well, can I well go ahead go ahead, Juan, I'm done. I I can wait. I ain't got nothing to do. <laughs> so she came out like whoop <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Who had a question? Rico? Somebody yeah, I, that, that was me. Actually, actually, I wanted to make a statement. I wanted to say that uh, I've been looking at a growing trend um, with the American church. And believe it or not, a lot of people are electing to do home churches. You know, uh, one, because of the financial strain of burden being lifted from the larger congregations. Um, the second thing is having a personal opportunity to actually be one-on-one -on -one with the person. And I'm going to say from my experience, when I got saved back in 96, I went to a home church first. So I, I, I understand, and I was in that church for years, so I understood how I grew from a home church into another ministry. And we had about maybe 20 members, you know, having praise and worship in the living room, you know, you know the plastic chairs um and you know it was the it was it was the weirdest thing for me because i that was my first time experiencing church at a home church you know and right. you know you know when i got saved right. however it was a great atmosphere because it was more personable you know when you go to when you go to a larger ministry it's so formal you know, and, and I always say this a lot of times on the threads, you know, when I'm ministering to people and, and sharing the gospel, you know, when you're a pastor, you're responsible for all these people. So you should know all the people that's in your church when you look at the Church of Acts, because now we got this mega ministry syndrome. Everybody wants the mega church. Well, there was no mega church in Acts. When the churches got to a certain size, they broke off, you know. Um, and so I think and, and, and I listen to everything, and of course we have a relationship, and I know everything, but the, the thing is, is being the person that you are, and I know your heart and the heart of your wife, is really a blessing for those people. I just think sometimes in ministry, you got people that God, you, you know, you got people that God has sent to your church to be pillars, right. like, like Alfonso. You know, or people that they're going to ride or die with you. Right. And then, you know, you're going to, God's going to send people that are going to migrate from pillar to post, so to speak. You're coming, you're planting a seed and they'll move on. But I think that people are safe, more safe, just based on seeing a lot of things that are happening. Um, people are more safe in smaller ministries. Because you can, you know, you don't have to come with the burden of spending a lot of money, you know. And one thing I love about you, and as like my pastor, you know, you don't take a, you don't take a salary from the church. 
You know what I mean? You work a, a regular job. You know, there's nothing wrong, you know, because the Bible said a workman is where there's a hiring. So, you know, I'm not saying that some people have, God has put some people in ministry and then full-time ministries, you know, and then they can make money doing what they're doing. But I think we're seeing a growing trend in America where the home church hurt, the home churches are growing. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know for one, people don't want to, people are smart now. They, they hip to the hustle. Now, I'm not saying you got to do whatever God told you to do, but people are smarter now, you know, when you got an a offer man for the building fund, you got an offering, you know, for the kitchen fund, you got an offering, you know, for the shoe fund, you got an offer, you know, for the, the pastor's wife fund, you got an offering for the children ministry fund, and you got about 12 offerings you're going to give into, and then you don't see the ministry growing, you know. Now, I'm not saying, you know, People, you know, every pastor man takes money. I'm just saying that a lot of times pastors mis misappropriate the funds. I mean, I've been a part of ministries where pastors misappropriate the funds. When the pastor say, well, hey, brother, can you donate $1,000 for a set of chairs? You know, I'm like, man, $1,000, bro. I'm like, man, I want to be faithful. I want to be able to you know, give to the ministry because you are supposed to give to your local church. So you sow a seed to help the ministry. You know, I come at the church the next week. Homeboy got some rims. No, <laughs> on his truck. All right, no, true story. So it's like, well, okay, the plumbing in the bathroom is foul. You need to re have it re you know redone. That's gonna cost you about seven, eight grand. So really, before you're trying to get rims on your truck, then I understand that you may have had this money in four one k. It doesn't matter. But instead of you taking getting the rims on your truck. Man, fix the plumbing in the bathroom. So people so have to be stinking when you go back to the use the bathroom. You know? <laughs> and so when people see that, because I know for one for me, that turned me sour. You know, because I saw like, man, you're leading me and you you don't you're not really smart with money. You don't and, and a lot of times the people don't say that to the pastor. They just kind of look at you from afar, like, you know, they see you see your actions and see you do stuff. I was like, man. He asked me for a thousand dollars. I gave him a thousand dollars. I only imagine, you know, how many other people raised their hand that Sunday and got up and you know went to the offering plate. You know, they say he probably made seven, eight grand. You go get rims put on your truck and you didn't fix the bathroom. So I think uh, the the home church is a good idea, you know, and then it gives you an opportunity, you know, to get to know your people on a personal level. And I think you know sometimes you just don't get great people. And I, I agree with what the doctor just said, you know, I know you and you have a good heart. I know your, your wife, she got a good heart. You know what I mean? And I just think that you came across people that just wasn't serious about the Lord, you know, and it causes a riff, causes issues, you know, and I would say, you know, and I don't ever try to tell you anything to do, man, because you, you're knowledgeable, you're wise, man, you know, the hand of the Lord is on you. I would say, man, hang in there for a minute because people are coming out of those churches. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying? They're coming out because, you know, you, gotta, you, got, you got guys that are trying to grow churches and they're trying to run them like multi-level multi marketing businesses and they're doing nothing but leveraging money. I mean, all of us are in the financial services world. We understand the hustles that pastors, man, do. Right. You know, and, they, and a lot of those pastors, man, are trying to hoard up funds for their families, sending their families to colleges. You know, and and you know, I'm not saying every church. I'm just saying the growing trend in America. And you can look at the stats, and and actually, and those are not churches that are doing that. But the home churches, I think, gives a better opportunity to speak to the whole man of a person. You know, um, but that's my that's my two cents. And so, but how do t tell me, Pastor? How do you feel about that? What I just mentioned. How did? What, what's your take on that? I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, um, I, and I, I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm against uh, uh, house churches at all. Matter, matter of fact, I think I'm, I'm one of the one of the biggest advocates for uh, house churches because I know that they get a lot of bad press. Um, but then at the same time, conversely, you have house churches that think that they are the church because they meet in a house, and if they don't meet in a house, then it is not a true church. I'm like, no, 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 no. 
a church is a church when you have a gathering of born again, spirit filled believers who have godly leadership and you are practicing the one another's in scripture and you are maintaining the gospel of Jesus Christ and you are preaching the gospel. You are discipling the same. You're evangelizing the lost and you are holding each other accountable and you meet at a place at a scheduled time. That is what makes up the church. So what the problem comes is when you have a, you have an imbalance. You get an extreme. People will say, well, on this side, this is the true church because people meet in the house. And then you have on this side, well, no, you're not a church because you don't have a building. You need to get a building. I'll tell people this. If God is not moving you to either one and you do opposite of what he's telling you to do, then you're in sin. You're in disobedience, period. Because not everybody is going to be in a, in a, in a, in a local fellowship. And not everybody is going to be I mean, in a, in a local house church. And not everybody is going to be in a, in a building. I'll tell you this also. You have churches like John MacArthur. 7,000 plus members. How does this man keep accountability intact? Well, he has 33 elders, last time I checked, 33 or 34 elders. And these 33, 34 elders are over families and over cell groups. And check out what they do. Every Lord's Day, when these members come to church on Wednesday night, but particularly on Sunday morning, they come to church when during the offertory period, there are one of three different cards there. That family has their, their, their color code and they have to write their name or to let the elders know that are over them that they came to church that Sunday. Now, I don't have a problem with that because you know why? You and I do that at work every day. It's called a time card. When you and I go to work, unless you are self-employed or contracted, you have to respond accordingly to that company that you agree, that you listen, that you and I committed to go to work at a certain time, to be at our position or in our office or in our place of business at a certain time. We go to lunch, come back at a certain time. We were paid to do an assigned work. Now, if that's true in the secular world, then why are we giving the spiritual world, why are we giving the church scraps? Why, why are we having this convenient attitude of saying, okay, I can just go to church anytime I want, or I ain't gonna listen to nobody, but we want people to listen to us. We, and these are the same people that fight authority, but want people to submit to their authority. That's hypocritical. Um, so I, I agree with you 100%. I will only say that there is possible for accountability to, to be biblical if it's managed and, and maintain and lead according to God's way. I mean, listen, you got a house church of people, man, and if a person want to be accountable, like, like Dr. Harley said, they're not gonna be accountable if they move and go into a 50,000 member church. You going yeah, you, you, you'd be more susceptible to hide and, 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 and more successful to not be seen as much. But man, people don't want to be accountable. Like you said, it's a hard issue, man. Um, I, I think for us, what we're doing right now um, we need to heal. We, we need to be ministered to uh, for ourselves. Um, we're, not, we're not angry at the church. We're not angry at the members that, that, that are comprised of this church. Uh, we're not anti-authority. We're not anti, you know, uh, a big church or anything. What we are is anti-rebellion. <laughs> what we are is anti, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> anti-antinomian. We, we're against anything that goes against God's word. And so we just want to encourage people to say, listen, Whatever place and whatever station you are, my 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 goal tonight is to those pastors and their wives that are going through hell, that are going through hard times because you have a few people that are that are messing it up for the majority. Now, again, the smaller the church, bro, the bigger the issues, and that's just that's just that's just is what it is. Um, I had told someone earlier today, if I had to compare my church um, to the seven churches that were in Revelation 2 and 3, I would have to add an eighth one. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, would have to add, I would have to add an eighth one. It would be the Church of Corinth. That's what I would say our church became. My church became the Church of Corinth. Wow. I, I'm just re Listen, this is real, y'all. And this is what I told people tonight. I told people earlier. We're not here to play games. You need to examine your church pastors, you need to examine your church and ask yourself some heart penetrating and even maybe some heart wrenching questions. What kind of church are you? 
because everybody want to be the Philadelphia church and the church of Smyrna, the two churches that Jesus didn't deal, didn't have to deal with. No, no, no. You may be at, at the, the Ephesus church. You may be a Laodicean church. You may be a Thyatiran church. You, you, you may, you, 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 listen, you, 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 you need to you need to examine your church and find out which church you are. And if you're not one of the seven churches in Revelation two and three, you may look at yourself and say, okay, uh, maybe I am, you know, the church of Thessalonica. That's a Nike. Okay, we 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 know we we're, we're so we're so easy to hear rumors that we allow it to shake our faith. That's what that's what the Thessalonian church was was dealing with. You know what I'm saying? So I'm saying for myself as the pastor uh, of His Word is way. At the time when we were in in his existence, bro, we, it, it was Corinthians. Wow. Now, Pastor Seiko, we got a couple of people with questions. April's next, and then um, Pastor Juan, because he's a pastor as well. Sure. Hey, April. Um, hey y'all. I, I just wanted to say I, I am so grieved by this simply because um, I, there – but the, but I can't even get my word out. I am so grieved <laughs> by this. You know, I love to talk. But I, I'm, I'm probably more grieved by it just because, you know, my husband always says, you know, people do what they want to do. Yeah. And real quick, you know, I don't, you know, but I wanted to read First John 3, verse uh, 16 through 18. It says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods yeah. and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Basically, talk is so cheap. And we've all been guilty of it, but talk is cheap. And we can't say that we love our brothers or we, you know, I'm riding with you and I'm rocking with you. And then when you find out that somebody you know has a legitimate need and all you want to do is pray for them, no, you need to help me put some on these lights. You worship <laughs> here too. Like, what's wrong with you? Yep. So we just it's gonna real. stand around and pray? And like, here we got Georgia Power. So when Georgia Power comes to turn the lights off, what we gonna do, stand around and meet us? And a single long leader, no, we're not going to do that. They want some money. Right. And I, I once heard Pastor Harley preach a sermon. I mean, he went in. Yeah. It was like a six-series message about how, you know, when prayer, prayer is not a substitute for action. Mm. And whether it's a house church or, or, or a, a Lakewood-sized church, you know, prayer is never a substitute for action. And to hear that, you know, I have brothers and sisters. I mean, we, we all have our struggles and, you know, bills ain't going nowhere. Right. But to hear, you know, my brothers and sisters say, you know, that they have a legitimate need and people that are in close proximity to them won't even accuse them of, of, of mishandling finances. Like, you, you need to be slapped. Like, what is wrong with you? That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. And and it, it makes me self examine my heart because, you know, I get on these little nappy headed kids when you make them a meal and they decide they don't want it all and they just gonna throw it in the garbage and I'm like, We ain't got money to waste around here. I could be giving that money to somebody else. So, you know, I'm I'm not saying granted, you know, we, we definitely support, you know, free will giving and we're not yeah. under compulsion or obligated right. to give, but if you're in a fellowship with each other you know what I'm saying? You should not be worrying about, you know, your carpet's getting clean, Sharon. You shouldn't have to worry about, you know, you shouldn't have to worry about none of that mess. And and that is sin. And, um, you know, that that's just wrong. I, I have this serious issue with that. I'm, I'm still grieved trying to get over that because that's, that's a problem. And I don't blame you. I'm like, y'all, y'all don't want the word. Y'all don't want the truth. But we going somewhere, we're going to get somewhere and get some truth. And they're going to be held accountable for what they failed to do and how they failed to act. And, and all, no. Put me on mute. I'm done. I'm upset. <laughs> I'm about to sin. Put me on mute. I want you to get your hands up. I mute myself. Because you, you upset and you pulling my hair. Oh, my goodness. You pulling that baby's hair. 
Okay. Uh, it's probably like mommy is hurting. You okay? Yeah, I mean, she's like, look, I understand. I get. I ate my food, mama. I ate my. Let me see. No, she didn't. She the one that messed up half of her hamburger. You didn't eat your hamburger today. Oh my goodness. Okay, um, Juan, you want to un unmute yourself? <laughs> oh my goodness. What's up, Juan? Yeah, I'll unmute you. What's happening, bro? Y'all hear me? Yes, yeah. sir. All right, cool, cool. Um, I just want to say, man, uh, you know, my heart's broken. Uh, praying for you guys, definitely. Appreciate um, that. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> some of the things you were mentioning were very close to uh, a season. I, I feel like a season we've been getting out of with uh, members who um, just members uh, that were uh, disobedient um, <clears throat> to discipleship, to yeah. church attendance. And yeah, I, I wanted to ask the question, like, what are some of the things for the members of the church that um, maybe uh, uh, the church together could have done better. Like uh, maybe, uh, like what did the uh, members meetings look like? Um, could there have been uh, things in place uh, that could have addressed some of the issues better? Um, I'm asking just cause we've, uh, I feel like we're defining membership a little bit more biblically and clear. Mm -hmm. And it's helping us to kind of like uh, engage the congregation um, in a way where we can say, hey, this is, uh, this is what we're agreeing to. This is where we're standing. And it keeps people more accountable. Uh, and so I just had a, a couple of those questions, like what, what are some of the things you think could have been done as a church to address some of the issues earlier on before they got worse like um that would help me as a pastor yeah. um especially because we're a church plan we've been there for five years and now it's kind of like we're really trying hard to mm -hmm. to to tether back membership to the bible um and so you know I, and i don't want to go into the whole story but yeah, we just yeah, came yeah. out of a rough situation with a church we had to leave because of a denial of the deity of christ and it was just a mess we were wounded and then we kind of like licked our wounds for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. And then now we're kind of like finally maturing a little bit yeah. as far as membership and things like that. Yeah. So that, that was, you know, one of the questions I had uh, for you, bro. Uh, um, what, well, I, I'm glad that's a good question, bro. Cause uh, what we did was um, anytime I, I noticed or saw an issue that was either potential uh, of being a problem I brought it out to the forefront, like, hey, this is something I think we need to give attention to, and here's why. So we opened up the floor for communication. We, we had, you know, even during our uh, discipleship times, because what we did was um, our worship would be at, at, at 10 o'clock. I, I would basically come up to preach around 11, 12, 12.30. 12 uh, 12.30 uh, would be the end of our, our, our pulpit preaching. Then we have our discipleship slash Sunday school time. Um, we went through church history. We, we dealt with even, even issues that were affecting our church. And brother, when I say one of the dangers I had mentioned to our church was, was this. I said the dangers of going to a church like ours or any other expository church <clears throat> is that you're going to be held accountable even more so for what you know to be true than a person who does not have a sound biblical church to go to. I said because you're getting truth there. So, so the communication, bro, was always, always laid out. I mean, Doc, I, I mean, people in our church, they had my number. I got people, bro, in my church that's outside of my church. That had, I mean, I made myself access, accessible. Um, you know, it, counseling, any issues, bro, that we needed to address, we addressed it as a family, Doc. Um, and so, all hours of yeah, all hours of the night. I mean, <laughs> bro, we've, we've had conference calls. We've had church meetings. We've had all of those things. And so it's kind of like what, what Rico was saying, what Dr. Howley uh, was saying. Brother, it's about accountability when a person don't want to be accountable, man. And I see for us for, as pastors, it's hard because we know the blessings that come with commitment and obedience. You know, and like what Sister Sydney said, not compliance. So I'm talking about obedience, submission to God and giving authority. And so when we when we started noticing that man, it just started becoming like the unraveling of, of a of a cloth, 
you keep pulling that string, man, and it just it just untethers itself. And uh, and so uh, we try to keep the communication, man. You know, consistent. Um, you know, it. And I would say this also. I try to be as gracious as I possibly uh, could because not everybody's issue was the same. You know, the Bible tells us to uh, admonish un, un, the unruly and curse the faint hearted and help the weak, right? Be patient with all men. So there were some things or some people that I could not uh, help had to admonish. You know, some people that I couldn't admonish, I had to just come alongside and, you know, and encourage. And so it took time with that. Um, some people felt that this person should have been checking, like, no, because you don't know the background of that. And trust the leadership with that. So the communication thing, I think, man, was uh, was what the communication and accountability and follow up is what we try to maintain and to try to keep consistent in our church. That's dope, man. Um, yeah, I just want you guys to know what me and my wife over here, we're going to be praying for y'all. And uh, yeah, um, I appreciate I'm, we're, it. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're learning, man. Um, church planning or, or house church uh, is is one of those things that I think uh, are, are very Look. challenging, uh, especially when you try to do it the way the Bible says to do it. Um, yeah. And so I just want to encourage you, bro. Um, again, I think you already know you've reached a lot of people, uh, and I think you you will continue to do that. I just want to encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, we're all still Did listening. Talk about my other about talk. I appreciate Mother's that. Too. Yeah. Fresh. Love you guys, man. Praying for hey, you. Well, now, I from? said with the jury, I thought it was too bad. Who you got on okay. mute, uh, unmuted? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm checking now, out. sir. I'm checking now. Can you check the man the board, please? Can you cut somebody out? So you don't think it go? Oh, it's Keisha. So, like somebody finna go to war. That was Keisha. Hello? <laughs> okay, David Hello? had a question. All right. No, pretty much a, a statement. Uh, I just thank God today. I'll see you another up, day man? here. Hey, good to see you, Nothing man. Much. God is good. Uh, seeing another day, right day today here in the Middle East. Uh, what I really want to say is I just, uh, you know, I'm not talking as though I believe anything is over with. It's just the start of a, a new regime for me, the way I see it from looking from the outside in. Uh, seeing the things that are coming to America that's already establishing themselves. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a separation in, in all cases of, of, of the wheat from the tear. Not saying people weren't saved, but disobedience, sometimes they need to be separated. And then when God's wrath comes upon this, this, this country or earth, then people tend to come back together again. Yeah, uh, I'm seeing a lot of that even here, you know, uh, People don't want truth anymore. Uh, and the thing of it is, is that it separates those who are professing uh, Christians and those who are truly uh, uh, elect or remnant. Mm. Uh, I, I met you, Seiko, four or five years ago, uh, unconverted, uh, not regenerated, uh, and God used that format of war uh, that many amount of years, about six years ago, five years ago, who knows? It's been gone. It's gone so quick. But the thing of it is, he used that as a as a tool to draw uh, me to him. Uh, I don't just look at that was just a one time phenomenon. No, there's a work that has to be done. Uh, things must go on. It, it's going to come a time America doesn't realize. Some people they don't realize what's coming down the pipeline. Right. Uh, that's going to bring people really together. I mean, really soon. You know, I'm not here prophesying anything, but it's a fact. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing things from the outside in, uh, apart from the everyday tussle and bustle that you guys go through. But I'm going to tell you this. Uh, uh, people are going to be, uh, I believe, even now, church, house, ministries, whatever ministry you call it, house, church, whatever, when, when those sheep are hungry and when those sheep are lost and fearful and God – wrath is placed upon this earth upon that country in, in, in general then the, the, the severity part of that's why I stayed up this long to, to be part of this and God knows is that they're going to need some foundations some pillars that are still standing uh, regardless of, of, of what they've done what they've thought uh, the contributions they made or did not make uh, you know at the end of the day uh, sheep that are disobedient have to obey through, through either through, through the word of God, number one, or through God's wrath and anger. Uh, 
I can't sit here and preach to anybody. I, like I told you, I came underneath your ministry and, and I've learned a tremendous amount of things based on your ministry and God has really developed and, and grew me over these years and still growing. But to say, uh, well, you know, it's over. No, well, you got a family still to preach to. You know, you still got uh, people who are that, that one, whoever shows up, preach to the chairs. We used to say that back in the, uh, the, the church of God in Christ. Preach to the yeah. chairs. Preach to somebody. Because guess what? You still have to be open. I'm just right. saying this. This is my opinion today. I've never talked to you. This is the first time I've ever actually I talked to you other times, yes. But face, seeing face to face, I want to say this, brother. Uh, you know, keep, keep the faith. As, I know you're going to do that. That's not, you can't do anything but that. But what I really want to say is uh, endure this hardness as a good soldier. Yeah. Uh, and it hurts. Yes, church hurt is, is, is the worst kind of hurt. But, man, we need some pillars that's going to keep standing. So when uh, there's a refuge somewhere for people who actually God has opened their eyes fully and through uh, persecution and afflictions have somewhere to go. Uh, if they want to come, let them come. If they don't, still do what you do to the best of your ability. I mean, for me, I, I mean, I'm getting messages. I didn't know it was 12 people, 13, or however many people you said. But for me, the only thing that counted to me was the message. I don't care. For me, it didn't matter who was there or not. It was what I needed, you know. And, and, and this is what strikes me to the heart is because yeah, there are other outlets that we can go to, but the thing of it is, is that uh, uh, I'm, I'm one to, to stick to uh, where God actually led me from to where I'm at. I'm, I'm faithful, I'm a faithful individual. And I, I, I still want, uh, I, I still pray, I'll pray that, you know, God intervenes in your heart that you have somewhat of a change of mind uh, just to keep the foundation there and continue to do what you do. Because like, like I'm saying, uh, America is facing some detrimental times and is, is about to be shaken uh, with the hand of God. Uh, we, I'm just not saying it by what I, I'm not going to go into detail, but what I see from, from the outside in, brother, I wish I had a church to go to. I wish I had people that I could uh, fellowship with. I wish I had brothers and sisters. That, so if anything even happened here, I have no refuge. I have to come back to, to, to someone like you or to someone like MacArthur or Piper or, or, or people that are uh, professing the faith correctly and, and preaching the gospel uh, correctly. Man, it is, it's coming to separation. Who, do you don't want to obey? Well, you got to go your way, and then you know, got to deal with you, but you'll be back. Separation is, is, is clear. I'm starting to see a lot of that going on, even here. You know, and, and I have to endure hardness. Uh, everybody knows that I posted, uh, and I'm just going to say this, and I'm done, uh, dealing with separation. You have people uh, here, even uh, your families. You know, my, None of my family are regenerated. Uh, my heart goes out for them. Uh, so therefore, my family is the Seiko Woods, the the John MacArthur's, the John Pipers. You know, th this is my family. Th these you guys are the only uh, line of communication I have to deal with the truth, apart from me reading my Bible myself. Understanding God's word, I never understood anything. I, everything I got was from hearing what you taught and what you're teaching. That's that's the pillars that people are searching for. Not just there in Texas, man, all over the world, brother. Bro, we depend on man. You man, keep preaching the word, man. Regardless if they come or not, you just don't know, bro. Keep preaching the word. We need, we need you to keep, keep the, keep preaching the word, man. I don't care if it's just your kids, because you don't know what God has and how it is. But walk alone here, man. We we need you. People gonna need you. They don't realize it now, but you know, time will tell real shortly. But God bless you. I pray my strength in the Lord. And you just you just love your wife and your family, man, and y'all stick together over there because the hand of God is mighty and it's coming. People don't they gonna know what's hit, they ain't gonna know what hit them into, and they're gonna need each other to hold to, to hold to the to the to the faith, man. People over here being persecuted, they're getting their heads cut off, man, every day. And they and, and they'll have nobody to support them. They they stand with God alone. 
And sometimes that's what we need to understand. I was a disobedient person. We got to stand with God alone first sometimes so that we can understand the true power of God and the true power of brotherhood. I can understand what Paul and them were talking about. But they missed the people in Thessalonica. When he had his heart went out to the, the church of Corinth, it's because people, even though they're disobedient, their heart, his heart, their, which our hearts should still go out for them, and we should still have something in place just in case they come back home. God bless. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Such an emotional testimony. It's kind of like, what do you say after that? Um, I wanted to read this to you guys. This is, uh, this is what I receive every month from Sermon Audio. <clears throat> and, um, this is what I read to our church. You know, this is one of the, this is one of the means of communication that we used to read, uh, to our church. And actually I look forward, I always looked forward to it every, every month, every month I used to, you know, uh, read it to our church and hopefully, you know, that they would like, man, okay, all these, all these countries and all these, you know, cities and states are listening to just, just us, just to boost encouragement. So I wanted to just read this, you know, to, um, to everybody. Um, this is from April of 2016 this year. Uh, so far we have 220 sermons online, uh, live stream 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, um, here are the top MP3 sermons that have been downloaded this month. This is what I read to our congregation every every month. Uh, Arminian versus Calvinism debate. You will love that, Sydney. <laughs> uh, the Modern Family by Pastor Alfonso Neal. Uh, Arminianism, Calvinism debate, part two. The tithing, tithing debate, part two and one. Uh, How is your love life, part one. Uh, the demonic demise of a generation. Body life, 101. Uh, Mirrors, a reflection of spiritual maturity by uh, Pastor Alfonso Neal, and also first degree murder. These were the top ten uh, sermons that were downloaded uh, this this uh, this past month. Um, let me just let me just share with you guys, uh, and just bear with me because I want people to hear what we what we did for the body of Christ, and 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 just to encourage. As well, and it also confirmed what Brother David uh, said as well, because he's one of the brothers who whose 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 country is on this list. And every time I saw the country, my mind automatically went to uh, to Brother David. But nationally, from uh, uh, from our uh, country, uh, Washington. Here are the following states: Washington, New Jersey, Texas, California, Georgia, New York, Virginia, Colorado, Ohio, Illinois, Florida, Mississippi, Maryland. Uh, Massachusetts, Missouri, North Carolina, Alaska, Arkansas, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Arizona, Tennessee, Indiana, uh, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Iowa, Michigan, Kentucky, D.C., Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Oregon, Utah, Montana, Louisiana, Kansas, Idaho, Nevada, and West Virginia. Uh, that's 39 states that's just in this month alone that have uh, supported and listened to our sermons uh, here at our church. Internationally, the following countries are the UK, uh, Canada, Australia, Germany, Spain, Switzerland, China, Japan, Qatar, Sweden, Malaysia, uh, Namibia, New Zealand, Denmark, Puerto Rico, South Africa, Singapore, Iceland, Italy, the Republic of Korea, Costa Rica, Bahamas, Botswana, uh, the Philippines, Netherlands, uh, Mauritius, Mexico, St. Kitts and Nevis, the uh, United Arab Emirates, and Zambia. Um, so far, just in April's uh, report of Sermon Audio, 39 states and 30 countries uh, have downloaded and have listened. I would never, ever see who these people are. Um, 
unless they are born again, I'll see them in glory. But, you know, these are the people that we have preached to and, um, and have, you know, reached through the means of internet radio, through the means of summit audio. Um, I'm, I'm going to continue to preach the word of God. Uh, I'm going to, you know, continue to post sermons online. Um, you know, and, and, and just in, in, in the, the fact that, you know, people like David, you know, that's, that's, those are the people that I knew I was, I was, it was hurting. It would, it would affect, um, it, it wasn't any more about those from within. Um, and, 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 and I think selfishness has really, has really done a lot of damage in a lot of churches and, and just in relationships. Um, and it, it is just, it's heartbreaking. And um, for me, I, I, I wanna encourage pastors all over the place, all over the country, all over the world, if you're listening to this, you know, um, you may not be appreciated, but there's people like David that appreciate you. People like April Chapman, people like you know, Rico Gibson, people like you, Sydney. I mean, you know, I mean, people, people like Sister Keisha and, and, and so many others, you know, uh, Brother Rafi. I mean, people that I've never even met before um, that have, you know, have reached out to me and have, have, you know, said, hey, you know, I, I'm going to keep you in prayer. You know, Dr. Harley Howard, you know, um, that's that has really been been the, the, the strength outside of my wife and, 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 you know, people here. Let me just share this also with you guys as well. You know, uh, we mentioned about you know my my, my co-elder, a former co-elder here at our church. You know, when we when we had it in existence, Alfonso Neal. This brother was a member of our church from day one, and uh, he really he was the he was the person that we were able to 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 I guess come alongside he he basically wanted to be at a place where he can grow uh he came from a roman catholic background uh he got saved and a year later he came to our church was one of the first members there and and when i say die hard when i say committed brother and lord this man is committed and so when when the church shut its doors for the last day you know i never really seen him cry i don't see him cry one time and that was briefly very very brief but this man, this man broke down during the offertory period, you know, because I, I, I didn't even want, I didn't want anybody to give. I was like, you know what, Look, you don't have to give anything. It doesn't even matter. It's, I, I, you know, he's like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do the offering, and he said, you know what, it's really sad that, that a man cannot be supported by the church that he has preached and, and has labored with. And I'm just reciting what he has said, but he broke down crying because he, 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 he was here for seven years almost seven years and, and 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 this is where he this is where he grew and this is where he was taught and so um so when he was affected by that it just really it just really broke me and then 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 hearing what david you know said and man my heart goes out to these people man and so you know I, i'm going to by god's grace you know continue to, to to bring the word of god as much as i possibly can because i'm not going to shut up i'm not going to do that you know, we, we're not, we're not, we're not stopping. You know, this just, this is right here. Just a, this is just a detour. Um, but I'm not deceased, and uh, uh, and so you know, I'm, I'm going to be posting, you know, devotionals and sermons and things like that. Um, um, I, I want to be faithful to God's word. I want to be obedient uh, to Him as well. But I know my family is, you know, I know my family. They need to be, you know, fed and supported spiritually. Um, and, and, and this is the reason why we did the show. This is the reason why we wanted to do this 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 uh, this video because I really believe that somebody after we after this video posts is going to be blessed by it. I mean, tears, snot, and all, they're going to be blessed by it because this is this is this. I believe this is what real life and life on life is about. You know, if Paul can say, man, you know, for three years with tears, I've been laboring and warning and telling y'all. Hey man, this is what it's about. I, I, you know, and, and, and I'm not. I'm not trying to keep my quote unquote man. I'm, I'm a man because God created me a man. You know, but I have feelings like everybody else does. And and, and people can say, well, man, you know, he hating on hip hop and this and all that kind of stuff. Look, I hate on anything that hates on God's kingdom. Amen. That's it. Period. I don't care who it is. This is about the kingdom of God. This is about the bride of Christ. This is about the body. This is about you and I. You know, building each other up, and 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 sometimes it gets messy, and um, you know, and so for me, 
I, I want people to understand that you cannot make it in this life by yourself. And if you are one of these people that if you're not, if you're not like Enrico has said, if you're not a pillar, then you're a problem. Okay. I want, I want people to understand that. if you, if you're not a pillar, if you're not going to support the church that you are, that you are in, then you're a problem. You can't be both. Because pillars provide support, they they provide you know stability, and if you're not helping to do that, then you, you you're part of the problem. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, what are you giving? Are you a spiritual leech, or are you are you trying to share life and own life with each, with with one another? And um, so I want to encourage pastors all over the place, all over the globe, all over wherever you hear this this video, and and, and once it's posted on YouTube, be encouraged. Surround yourself by people who are going to support you and also preachers' wives. I mean, we sometimes think that they are insignificant. No, you got women that are praying for their husband. Sister Keisha is a pastor's wife. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we, we have people probably are our pastor's wives and, and, and probably listen to this. They need to be ministered to. My wife, you know, last year, you know, uh, uh, one, my, my, my co elder's wife, you know, wanted to take my wife out for her birthday, was it? Was it birthday? She gathered the women that was here and, and wanted to know if they wanted to come and, and chip in to do something for her for her birthday. You know what they told her? Well, uh, you know, well, you know, if I'm not getting anything out of it, this, this paraphrase, I'm not getting anything out of it, why, why would I want to contribute to it? Just something as simple. Something as simple as, as, as that. It's, it's, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not acting, we're not trying to, listen, I, Ivy Hilliard had Ivy Hilliard's wife. Uh, uh, what is her name? Just that quick. Um, I can't Bridget, think of Bridget, Bridget, Bridget. Yeah. Bridget. Yeah, Bridget Hilliard. She advertised her birthday and said that basically this is what she want. I want, I want Louis bags. I want this. And, and, and don't think she didn't get it. Now that's a pimp. That's a pimp move. Okay. That's that's some that's some sucker move stuff. But she got her stuff. My wife didn't ask anybody to do anything for her. What, 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 what happened was one of the sisters, the, 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 the co-elder's wife, who sees what my wife does, said, hey, why, why don't we just do something, you know, show our appreciation? Now, I mean, just, you know, well, we, we may give you this, but we're not, we're not paying for the whole thing now. I mean, this, and I'm saying, we, we don't understand how demoralizing that is. But you know what? It didn't, it didn't change. It didn't stop her from, from ministering and from serving uh others in, in in the body and i'm just saying if you have a faithful man and woman of god then you need to be committed to those people because these are the people that god has placed in your life you know and that's why that's why i was just reciting what paul has said in first Corinthians 9 it is it is it too much it means it's too much for for us not to have the things that you i mean if you're eating steak can we have a steak i mean if, if you're if you're eating this can we not have this you know, and pastors are people too, but most importantly, our wives, man, we're one flesh. So I just wanted to share that. Do you have anything you wanted to add? Anything you wanted to? Well, that was on my list, but you just took Oh, oh my fault. My fault then. My fault. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Sydney's uh, bandwidth is getting low, but um, okay. but yeah, so, but anyway. Um, and I was also going to add to that too, you know, um, being protective of our children. Yeah. Um, in this whole thing um, is the lesson that you know we've had to learn is keeping our, our kids protected and uh, guarding them from being hurt um, but also telling them what's going on you know so that they can understand it on their level but also you know just guarding their heart and teaching them how to resolve things how to work things out in their own heart so that they don't become angry and bitter when they see and hear things that are going on because they they can hear and they see things just like we do yep so yep um let me see i think uh can anybody else hear us let me see let me try to refresh we can hear you see. fine okay oh, okay because okay, yeah like, i still hear you man okay good 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 it was it was the, the screen had froze up um i wasn't That's sure about obama internet I don't think so, ma'am, because my phone, I'm using, listen, I'm using my so phone. So you said the Obama internet. Oh, my God. It ain't going to work for long. 
<laughs> Yo, I'm look here, I'm using you my can get his router back in a couple months. How long how many yeah. months you get to keep your router? For your information, Missy Pooh, I'm using my hotspot on my phone because I love the body of Christ that much that I ain't want to use my old jacked up router uh uh in the house. So now <laughs> you can repent now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Awesome. Any so anything else, guys? Thank you for that. Anything yeah, else? I think that was a perfect way to close it. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. Uh, and I, again, I just want to just you know thank you for hosting it and yes. uh, uh, for letting us share our heart. I really hope and pray that people you know will hear our heart in this and that others will be blessed by it. Um, um, and and this this you know continue to do what God has called us to do. We we're, we are going to be uh, you know uh, fellowshipping with another church we haven't decided to join yet. Um, um, but we're going to see what God does with that. But we, we, we're not stopping our uh, fellowship with the body of Christ. We, we're, we're looking forward to what God is going to be doing. And, uh, and again, don't, don't worry about us in the sense of thinking that we're not going to be uh, connected to a church. We'll always be connected to a church. Amen. Amen. All right. Sister Sharon, anything else you want to add? No. Off of here? That's it for me. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys again. Thank you, Pastor Seiko. Thank you, Sister Sharon. Um, we will be praying for you guys. Um, have full confidence that God is still in control, that he is still leading, and that he will guide your family in whatever the decision may be. And wherever the next step may be, we know that God is leading you there. So we take confidence and we have peace in that. To everybody who was on here, thank you for your prayers and your support and taking time out of your Friday night to hang out with us. Um, we will see you guys on the flip side is what I always say. Grace and peace. God bless. God bless. All right now.